it's my privilege this morning to be able to share the word with you. I'm going to kind of, I guess, platform off of where we went last Sunday in the word. And really what we talked about last Sunday is that as a church, we are collectively believing that this is going to be a year of renewal and direction. Um, there is no shortage of people that need renewal spiritually, emotionally, and maybe even physically due to exhaustion. At the same time, uh, we, we need direction. And you need to understand your God is not, uh, not the author of confusion. And I don't think you have to kind of tiptoe through life trying to figure out what it is that God wants from you next. There will obviously be times to stop and pause and seek the Lord for whatever's next. But at the same time, I believe God can give you a vision. I believe he can give you a strategy and that you can run with that thing. And so that's what we're believing for this year, uh, that God's going to, even as we start this year off, just a time of renewal and a time of direction. And um, last week we talked about the life of Moses and how that Moses was able to experience God and ultimately see God in so many facets of his life. And that's something that, that we long for as well. We, we long for that experience in God. What ultimately happened with Moses is that God impacted the level of his purity. God reshaped and changed his perspective. And the Lord really set his passion on fire. I'd like to lean in this morning to that first aspect, and that is the subject of purity. And to do so, I want you to see one verse of Scripture. It's spoken by the words of Jesus. It was delivered during the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, verse number 8. Jesus said, God blesses those whose hearts are are pure, for they shall see God. God blesses those whose hearts are pure, for they shall see God. I think we, we all want to be blessed. Can I get an amen? We want to be blessed. At the same time, we want to see God at work in our life, in the work of our families, in our careers, in the things He's called us to, the purposes that He's ordained us for. And so we're going to unpack this this morning. Father, I ask you to help me to teach, help me to preach. God, help me to share your word in such a way that every single one of us are provoked to that next step that you have for us. God, let this not be a moment that is mundane or where we just go through the motions, but instead, God, impact us with the power of heaven. Let your kingdom come, let your will be done in earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name, this church said, amen. amen. Um, in the opening uh, pages of a book entitled Just Like Jesus, the author Max Lucado asked a question that I believe is somewhat similar to this one. What if for one day Jesus were to become you? What if for one day Jesus were to become you? As you kind of think about that, think about it within this concept. 24 hours, Jesus wakes up in your bed, walks in your shoes, lives in your house, assumes your schedule and your regular routine. Your boss becomes Jesus' boss. Your family becomes Jesus' family. Your pains become His pains. When you think about it, nothing about your life changes. Your health doesn't change. Your circumstance doesn't don't, circumstances don't change. Your financial status doesn't change. Your schedule isn't altered and your problems aren't solved. Instead, there's only one thing that changes. And that is for one day and one night, Jesus lives your life with his heart. I'm going to say it again. The only thing that changes is for one day and one night, Jesus lives your life with his heart. Your heart gets the day off and yet your life is going to be led by the heart of Jesus Christ. So for one day, the heart of Jesus, his priorities govern your actions. His passions govern, govern your decisions. His love directs your behavior. And so the thought of this change, I believe, has to like lead us to some probing follow-up questions. For instance, like, what would you be like? Would the people around you notice a change if your heart was replaced with Jesus' heart? Like, would your coworkers be able to tell that there was something different about you? Would your family notice that there's something new about you? 
friends that you've known for a really long time, like would they be able in that 24 hour period of time to notice, wow, he or she is different. People that are less fortunate in the community, would they be able to tell that there's something different about you if Jesus' heart was in the place of your heart for 24 hours? How about your enemies? Like like the people that have done you wrong or that maybe even up to this point you just didn't like. If Jesus' heart was in the place of your heart, would they receive mercy in a way that they've not been accustomed to from you? As you continue to kind of unpack this, like think about it for a moment, like how would you feel? Not, not just like what others would say or friends would say or coworkers would say or, or, or people that have known you for years. Like what about you? Like, like if, if Jesus' heart was in the place of your heart, how would you feel? Like what kind of alterations would this heart transplant have on your stress level, on your mood swings, on your temper, on your sleep? Would you look at sunsets differently or maybe even sunrises? Would you view death differently? Would you view taxes differently? Is there any chance that you'd need fewer Tylenol or maybe fewer sleep medications? Would you view traffic differently? The stuff that you dread, would you still be dreading it? The things that you're looking forward to, would you still be looking forward to it? If Jesus' heart was in the place of your heart in your life for one day and one night, would you still be doing what you are doing? Like if you were to say, okay, I I know that this is going to happen, and so now it is transpiring over the next 24 hours, would you keep the same plan? Would you keep the same agenda? Would you be pursuing the same ambitions? Would you tonight do what you did last night? Would you continue to do the same things that you do when presently no one else is looking? Like like if Jesus' heart was in the place of your heart, when it comes to your schedule, would you have the same obligations? Would you have the same commitments? Would you have the same engagements? Would you have the same appointments? The question is, if Jesus took over your heart, would anything change? It's an important question because what we learn through Scripture is that when it comes to the concept of a pure heart, the standard is Jesus' heart. In fact, in the book of Philippians chapter 2, verse 5, Paul wrote this to the church at Philippi. He said, you must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. And so when we're, when we're trying to say, okay, man, I want to be blessed and I want to be blessed because I have a pure heart so that I can see God and experience God and encounter God and have all these God moments, well, then how do I know if I have a pure heart? And yet scripture has made it clear that at the end of the day, the standard for a pure heart is Jesus Christ. And even in some of those questions that we've just been evaluating and we've thought through, like there, there's no doubt that if Jesus' heart was in the place of our own, our friends would notice a difference quite quickly. Our spouse would notice a difference quite quickly. Our coworkers and, 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 and the people that we're engaging with on a daily basis, they're going to recognize a difference because after all, it's Jesus' heart in the place of our heart. But yet at the same time, Jesus' heart is the standard. One pastor, he said it this way. He said, God's plan for us is nothing short of a pure heart. If you were a car, God would want control of your engine. If you were a computer, God would claim the rights to your hard drive. If you were an airplane, he'd take a seat in the captain's cockpit. But you are a person. And God has said that what he desires is the throne of your heart. And he says that he desires for that heart to be pure. Matthew chapter five, verse eight, God blesses the pure in heart. They're the ones that are going to see God. So in your life, when you think about purity, what is it that you envision? Like, how is it that you define that word? Well, obviously we've already set Jesus Christ as the standard, but the actual definition of the word purity is to be free from contamination. And I'm sure you're like me and you've noticed, man, there's no shortage of ways in which that the world is like trying to contaminate us. 
And this has been a problem that's been going on for thousands of years. In fact, 2,000 years ago, Paul wrote to the church at Rome and he told them, he said, be really careful that you don't be conformed to this world, that you don't become contaminated by the world. Instead, be transformed in the image of God. He was making a point even then that there were going to be challenges with purity, that the enemy was going to try to contaminate you. He was going to get you to try to think like the world instead of thinking like God, to try to have the perspective of the world instead of having the perspective of Jesus, to have passions for things that are after the flesh instead of having passions for things that are after God. And that's really what we've been talking about these last two weeks. At the end of the day, what we're saying is that we want to pursue God and that we are in pursuit of God. And that when we go throughout this year, like we just don't want this to be us living after our ambitions and our desires and whatever it is we've conjured up in our mind, but we want to see that God's plan and God's purpose is established in and through our life. Can I get an amen and a witness from somebody on a Sunday morning? That's what we're seeking direction for. And so I was thinking about how that um, our church, we have this thing called Heartbeat. And Heartbeat is designed for people who uh, aspire to platform ministry. And uh, even with worship teams, things like that, we walk them through about 10 weeks. It's kind of a small group setting. And we just really kind of talk about what the heartbeat of our church is. And ultimately, the heartbeat of this church is that we exist for one reason above all else, and that is because everyone needs Jesus. But what we recognize is that we can really only represent Jesus well to other people and cause people to have a desire for him if we ourselves are also making that decision to live like true followers of Jesus. And so if we're going to have the right kind of heartbeat, then, then we got to make sure that spiritually we're, we're doing what we can to make sure our hearts are pure. And so obviously in those settings, we would define that, that purity is to um, avoid being contaminated by the things of this world and the things of our flesh. But we also talk about the only way you can keep that from happening is you, you got to be intentional about some boundaries. And, and there's some things that you have to take control of. Because the Bible says this, it says you must resist the devil and then he will flee from you. That word resist does not in any way, shape, form, or fashion mean ignore. I'm going to promise you one thing. If you ignore the devil, he's going to steal, he's going to kill, and he's going to destroy until there isn't anything left. You can't just ignore the devil. You have to resist the devil. You have to, to take control of some things in your life. And so there's a lot of things we talk about in those settings, but just a couple of things we talk about in regards to purity is that you have to control the eye gate and the ear gate. Like, like constantly your eyes are taking things in and your ears are taking things in. What they've actually now proven through psychology is that men tend, tend to be more motivated by what they take in through the eye gate and women tend to be more motivated by what they take in through the ear gate when it comes to things or people that they would be attracted to. For instance, the man might be struggling with the lust of the eye, which would lead to the lust of the flesh, uh, being drawn away by what he sees. At the same time, uh, in many instances, the woman might be more vulnerable to hearing a compliment or hearing words of affirmation or, or, or hearing something that makes her feel good about herself. And when you start thinking about the ways that if you want to be in a godly relationship, that the enemy could then take that and begin to contaminate, there's no shortage of ways it could transpire. And so what you have to be intentional about is, men, what are you taking in through your eyes? Like, what are you letting in through those gates? Women, are, are, there, are there situations in your life where the, the enemy has slithered in and has begun to speak things that are causing you to have thoughts that are not of God? The ear gate and the eye gate. I was even just thinking about in general of how we struggle with this. That, that right now, if we were to just like kind of go across the room and say, uh, somebody volunteer your Netflix account and let's log in. And then let's put it on this big screen, whatever it is you watched last. Like, like most of us in that instance would be like, if that preacher that he's a heretic, like that's blasphemous. That's like, to put that kind of perverse thing in the house of God on a big screen. And yet the Bible says that you are the temple. 
And so that doesn't devalue that this is a sacred place where that we've chosen to worship together, but God prioritizes what you're letting into your heart. And yet we just kind of got this free flow with no boundaries, the enemy just pouring in, contaminating and contaminating. I look at it sometimes almost like all those things we've seen on the news that there's some big corporation upstream and they're just dumping all this toxicity into the river and then people downriver start dying and they don't understand why they're developing diseases and they don't understand why there's abnormalities and deformities. That is exactly what the enemy has done to modern society. He has poured toxicity and perversion into the things that are upstream from our life and we're not even paying attention to it and we're drinking it in and we don't understand the reason we make such fleshly decisions is because we've sown to the flesh the bible is clear that as a man sows he shall reap god in fact says on that subject he will not be mocked it will happen it is a law of god What scripture goes on to say is that if you sow to the spirit, you will reap to the spirit. But if you sow to the flesh, you will reap to the flesh. So you got to be intentional about what's coming in through the gates. And you got to make this decision of I'm not going to let just anything into my life. I was thinking about a second way that we have to be intentional about our purity. I think we have to choose to control the environment of passion. We have to choose to control the environment of passion. I heard the story about a mother that was concerned about her son because he had a live-in girlfriend. And so she was one of those smart moms. She decided that she was going to volunteer as a housekeeper to go check things out. And so she goes over to the house and turns out her son is the only one there. And She's like, son, I just wanted to come over and just kind of help you keep house, help you clean some things, do some laundry. And, um, and the son, starting to feel a little bit of tension, admits that his girlfriend is living with him. But he says, now, mom, it's not what you, it's just not what it looks like. I have my bedroom. She has her bedroom. I sleep in my bed. She sleeps in her bed. And, God, and, and, and mom, we're not, we're not crossing these boundaries. And so the mom goes and he shows her the girl's bedroom. And it's clearly decorated with girly decor. And the mom feels somewhat satisfied and realizes that, you know, maybe she shouldn't push really hard at this time. And, but she decides she's going to have one little experiment before she leaves. So she facilitates that and then she departs. A couple of days later, her son calls her and he says, Hey, mom, um, you know when you were over here the other day and you were helping me clean up some things? Like, is there any chance that maybe you accidentally put our remote controls in your bag? Because we can't find the remote control of the TV. We can't find the remote control of the surround sound. We can't find the remote control of the LED lights. And she's like, well, well, sure, son. I put them in your girlfriend's bed. (laughs) I'm not going to get any help (laughs) on a Sunday morning. Uh, Some of you are like, that's my mom. (laughs) I think we really have to be careful about any kind of situation that's outside of accountability because there's a lot of different ways we can lose our purity. And for a moment this morning, we're centering in on the fact that one of those ways is sexual purity. And the Bible talks about the fact that anything outside of the bed of marriage is defiled, that that steals away our purity. And we all know of instances where The enemy came in through the eye gate, the ear gate, got a hold of someone's life, and they were no longer in control of the environment of passion. And and then the enemy just ran rampant. You know, talking about accountability, I I was seated with a man a few years ago, uh, CEO of a multi-million dollar business. I, I was serving him as a consultant. And we were talking through some things, and I just kind of started to notice his eyes as they maneuvered across the restaurant. And finally, it reached the point where I just asked him, I said, hey, man, how's things with you and your wife? He's like, oh, we're, we're doing great, man. We have a great relationship. And I said, are you sure? Yeah, man, every, everything's good. He said, I, I, I would never, ever go out on my wife. 
And I said, really? Because you went out on her four times since we sat down here. You see, there is a language of the eyes. And one of the things that the enemy will do is he will start getting you to speak a silent language if he can't get you to speak a verbal language. And one of the things that that gentleman concluded as we talked through it is that he was in a place where he would never desire to physically betray his wife. But he just had to know that he could if he wanted to. And his eyes was bringing him into conversations of betrayal. It's interesting to me that even when you start thinking about purity and things that we have to control and the environment of passion, it's really important to have witnesses in your life. That's a part of accountability. If you're married, it's, it's very important that you give great caution to ever being alone with someone of the opposite sex. Uh, my wife and I, we've just drawn a conclusion and this is something we live. Anybody that knows us on a personal level would validate this, speak to this. Many, many years ago, we just decided any form of communication is going to have both of us involved. It's just not up for negotiation. And so if, if I'm texting someone of the opposite sex, either she or someone of accountability that's in that same realm of business or conversation is involved. We decided we're going to share passwords. We've shared, decided we're going to share passcodes on phones and that at any moment she can take my phone, I can take her phone. A lot of that came from years ago, I was, uh, I was going to see one of my mentors and I was waiting to get into his office and he was delayed in a meeting with someone else and his wife, just a really strong personality, and she said, hey, young man, come right over here. Sit down right here. She had that grandma way about her. She sat me down. She said, I know you're here to see my husband. She said, but there's something you don't know about him. Many, many years ago, he had a moral failure. And it could have been prevented if someone would have had this conversation with me and him that I'm about to have with you. She went through, she walked me through a number of things, scripturally revelatory things that I don't have the time to share with you this morning. But one of the things that came out of that is she said, you got a two-hour drive home, and all the way home, you're going to make a list of every place that you are vulnerable. Every place that your purity could, could be vulnerable. And then you're going to set your wife down at the kitchen table and you're going to list all of that out. And she's going to do the same with you. And then when the devil walks in, you're going to have it at hello. And so for years, my wife and I have practiced that. It's been something that we felt like helps us to control the environment of passion. It helps us to be accountable. It helps us to have witnesses. One of the things that I, I was talking with a group of pastors, all of them pastoring over 3,000 people, I started sharing some of this and things that we feel like are just little life hacks God's given us to try to make sure that we keep purity. And I literally got laughed at. One or two of them, actually about three of them, started saying, you mean to tell me that your wife is in every form of conversation that you have across all the different businesses and things that you're involved in? I said, absolutely every single one of them. I said, my wife is too busy for that. I'm too busy for that. There's no way that we could give our time to that. And I said, it's not saying she has to read everyone or be in the knowledge of all of the things having the conversation. It's that she could if she wanted to, and it's a witness with an extra set of eyes. Today, all three of those pastors are no longer in ministry because of conversations that led to inappropriate touch. All three of them. And, I, and I'm not saying that to condemn them. And I'm not trying to make it sound like I've got it figured out and I'm perfect. The point I'm saying to you is this. We want to see God in our life. Can I get an amen from somebody? And there's a lot of different ways that we're struggling with purity. But it seems like to me that in the modern church, we're really uncomfortable talking about the need for sexual purity. And so we've just allowed the, limit, the enemy to go upstream and put all this contamination in and bring it down. And the next thing you know, we've got toxicity in the spiritual sense. Another way of saying it is that really the enemy just tries to infect us. And so if I could give you another metaphor that maybe would help you to visualize this. There, uh, think about a big tree, a giant tree, a beautiful tree, a strong tree. And then you go out one day and you see that tree laying on the ground. And when you're trying to figure out, well, what brought it down? What destroyed it? And then you go and you look inside 
And you discover that even though it appeared to be strong on the outside, there were all kinds of little tiny insects on the inside. You realize that that infection started from the moment that the first insect started to chew through the bark. And so in our lives, like if we were honest, some of us have a spiritual infestation. There's all these little spiritual insects that are chewing away at our purity and they're on the inside of our life. And some of us, we haven't spoke to some people in years and we take pride in the fact. Forget the fact that it's a spiritual insect eating away. Some of us, we've started to be greedy. We used to be generous, but, but now it's like there's this greed that's ruling our life, forgetting the fact that that's a spiritual insect that is eating away. Some of us fantasizing and believing things about other people and desiring them in inappropriate capacities, forgetting the fact that that's an insect that is eating away. And I share this with you this morning because I want you to get this promise. First thing I want you to see is Joel chapter 2, verse 25. And Joel says this under prophetic unction. He says, God will restore to you the years that the locust has eaten, the canker worm, the caterpillar, and the palmer worm. I don't, I don't know if there's a devil out there that looks like a locust or not, but I can tell you this, there's a devil out there that wants to eat away at your heart and just chew away and chew away and chew away and chew away. And he gets you to watch this. He gets you to listen to that. He gets you in this conversation. He gets you thinking about this other thing. He gets you harboring this stuff in your heart and you just start chewing and chewing away. And some of us don't even realize it, but we have lost years. To the infestation. Years. But here's the promise you need to see. In Joel chapter 2, 25, God says, I will restore to you the years that the locust has eaten, the canker worm, the caterpillar, and the palmer worm. Can I get somebody that's excited about the fact that God is a God of restoration, that he is a God that is looking not only to run off that infestation and to make you pure again, but he also says, I'll give you back the time that the devil stole from you while you were struggling in that regard. He is a God not just of deliverance, but he's in charge of the clock. And what better time to get some years back than starting in January? Don't let the enemy steal another year from you. Some of you have got stuff in your life that no one knows about. No one. You've hidden it. You've hidden it well. And it's eating, eating, eating away. Don't let the enemy steal another year. But not only seize this year, get some years back in the name of Jesus Christ. And so I want to invite them to play some music. But as they do so, I want to give you one just contextual promise that is pulled from Joel chapter 2, verse 25. It's one of my favorite in the entire Bible, and it's this. When God's involved, it is never too late to be who you might have been. I'm going to say it again for the sake of emphasis because somebody's got to get it this morning. When God is involved, it is never too late to be who you might have been. You could have spent years with addiction eating away at the inside of you. Years with pornography eating away at the inside of you. Years with adulterous thoughts eating away at the inside of you. Years with bitterness eating away at the inside of you. But this is a different year. This is a new year, and this is an opportunity not only to see December the 31st, 2024 look different than December the 31st, 2023, but also to see some years restored. You do understand we serve a God who can give you what you missed in 30 years in three years. Restore the years. How's it happen? How do you get that kind of promise? How do you experience that kind of restoration? Joel chapter 2 verse 12 holds the key. It says, "This this is why the Lord says, turn to me now while there is time. Give me your hearts. Come with fasting and weeping and mourning. Don't tear your clothing in grief, but tear your hearts instead. Return to the Lord God, for he is merciful and compassionate. He's slow to get angry. He's filled with unfailing love. He is eager to relent and not punish you. What a word. What a promise. 
What an opportunity you and I have this morning that in our lives that we can experience renewal and direction. That this can be a season of restoration in our lives. But it just starts with you and I making the decision, God, I'm going to give you my heart. I'm going to give you my heart. You do realize that you're never too young to become an example in purity. Certainly you're never too old. But you're also never too young. One of the things that Paul wrote to Timothy, he said, in your youth be an example of purity. Some of you young people under the sound of my voice, you've, you've not valued your purity because you live in a contaminated world. And the world has tried to convince you that it's, it's not something of value. And yet, today you get the reminder that maybe the thing God's calling you to is to be an example. And to let the heart of Jesus be the standard for your own heart. One of the things that Joel told the people of his audience, he said, if you're going to give God your heart, you got to make a decision to tear it. To tear it. The reason he said that is because up to that point, the, the people of Israel, they had this, this, this habit of when they would go into a time of repentance, they would be really demonstrative and, and really expressive in a public setting. And they would literally like tear their clothes. They would start picking up ashes and put it all over their face. And, and, and they would... Um, Throw, throw dirt and dust. And, and Joel says, stop it. God does not want the show. He just wants your heart. So all those places in you that have not measured up to Jesus right now, just tear it. And let God reshape it and remold it according to His plans. Father, I bow my heart and my mind before you just as this congregation does. And Lord, we come to you with an attitude of repentance. Lord, we realize that there is not a single one of us that is without sin. We thank you, Lord, that you've placed upon us the righteousness of Jesus through salvation. But at the same time, God, in our relationship, we've stumbled, we've slipped, we've failed. We've been contaminated we've had those little spiritual insects eating away at us. And God, we thank you that today there is the opportunity for renewal. But God, specifically today, I also pray for somebody that's never had this salvation experience. May they see the cross, may they see the blood that was shed for heaven's wrath against sin, and may they believe in their heart that as they ask you to be their savior, that you will forgive them of their sins. And may they, God, have the courage to confess to anybody and everybody with their mouth that you are their Lord. Holy Spirit, deal with them on an individual level. Even right now, God, as they lift their hand to you, see it as a heart of surrender. Others of us, God, this is a moment of rededication. Others of us, it's a moment of going all in. But at the end of the day, God, all of us have some time that needs to be restored as a result of the enemy's effects. There's places, God, where we, we didn't guard the boundary and we weren't intentional about the gates and the enemy slipped in. Lord, I thank you that today you're going to do what only you can do. Let it be done in Jesus' name. And this church said, amen and amen.